We discussed many times that the Mishkan laid the groundwork for Avod Hashem Yisbarach until Mashiach came on many different levels. Rashi tells us Bezois Yav Yarn Al Kardesh Bezois is Gemashi of 410, and that is the duration of time that by Yisrishim at the first place of Megdash stood. The Chassam Seifer explains. The first place of Mirish was a period of open miracles, where you saw the fire coming down from Shemayim, you had the Urim, the Tum, that flashed out heavenly answers, you had the Aaron and the Kruvin. So, Bezois Yav Yarn Al Kardesh, Aaron brought this power into the world for 410 years. Afterwards, all of these Nisan and miracles would be absorbed more into the scene, would be behind the curtain. But the Mishkan was the groundwork for Bayes Rishon, and Bayes Rishon, in a sense, paved the way for our Ilmon until Mashiach come. Furthermore, Malachim Seifer says, Bizais, Yavayarin and Lakardesh, Bizais is Gematia 410. That's the amount of time that the first Beis Amidish actually stood. The last two years of the first Beis Amidish, however, didn't have the same Kayach, because Nebuchadnezzar had already controlled the Beis Amidish, you didn't have the open miracles. There was a Kayach HaTilm already that surrounded it or prevented Yidin from sealing it. And therefore, Zeis Yavayarin, Zeis actually 408. This Zeis Yavayarin, and with this, is the overall bias region at 410. But the remnants over here to be Mechalik, between Zeis and Biz Zeis, represents even the last two years of bias region where you didn't quite have the same level of open miracles that you had during the other period. So the Ben Abachayim points out another remnant in the union of the Zeis Yavayarin al The term Zeis represents Knesset Yisrael. The term Zeis represents the Mitzvahs. These are the Schusim, the bags, the luggage that Aaron Akayim takes with him into the Kaddish Kedoshim. Or perhaps better yet, the armor that he has. The Mitzvahs of Klal Yisrael that stand behind Aaron to guarantee his success as the Shliach of Klal Yisrael to go in and plead for Klal Yisrael and to come out with Mechila, Slicha, and Kapar. Now how is it that the word Zeis represents the Nitzvahs of Klal Yisrael? Zeis explains that the Ben of Achaya represents the Schuss of Taira, the Zeis HaTaira. Zeis represents the Schuss of Mila, Zeis Berisi, Asher Tishmeru. Zeis represents the Schuss of Shabbos, Ashri Enash Yasa Zeis, the Pasuk says in Yeshai about Shabbos. Zeis represents the schos of Yerushalayim. The Pasuk in Yechaskel says, Zeis Yerushalayim, the Tzayich Hagayim. Zeis represents the schos of the Shvatim, the Zeis, Asher Dibe Lahem Aviyah. Zeis represents the schos of Yehuda, the Zeis Le Yehuda. And Zeis represents the schos of Knesset Yisrael at large. As the Pasuk says, Zeis Kemosech, Dam Salasama. Zeis represents the schos of Truma, the Zeis HaTruma. Zeis represents the schos of Mais Reis that Klai Yisrael gives. It's the one time you're allowed to test HaKadosh Baruch Hu when it comes to giving maestros. And Zeis represents the Schuss of Karbanis. As the Pasuk says, Bezeis, Yavli Aron El But it's all interrelated. The Schuss of Karbanis depends on the Schuss of Kalal Yisrael. The more the other Zeises shine, then the greater Aron HaKayim's Kayach is. When the Karbanis come to be Mechaper for us. Thus the Medrash says, as quoted by the Rebbeinu B'chaya, Kishra Yekayin Gadol Nichnes Lebeis, Kaidesh HaKedashim, Chaviloi, Chaviloi, Shal Mitzvah, Siyash Biyada. He has bundles and bundles of mitzvahs in his hands. And that guarantees his success. It depends how much luggage he has. In this instance, the more suitcases he checks in with, the better, the greater the reward. The Medrash Rabbi says, that's the child of the Pasuk in Mishlei. Referring over here, according to this Medjish, to the Chavilais, to the bundles and bundles of mitzvahs. The Aaron Chaim comes to fight his Muhammad with his Muhammad for Klal Yisrael. The Medjish quotes of Nasan and of Achim the Shem of Simai. In the Sifah Chavilais Shel Averis, what if you have bundles of the wrong thing? Bundles and bundles of Averis. So the solution is, Asei Kenegdan Chavilais Shel Mitzvahs then bundles of mitzvahs have to neutralize it. So the Pashib Shadiyan, if Anakayin has the wrong kind of luggage that is bogging him down and not helping him, he has bundles of Aveiros. So the only way to counter it is to add on as many mitzvahs as possible. So it appears that the Medjish is telling us that if a person was over many Aveiros, he should counter that with many mitzvahs. And that's how somehow he's going to save himself from the punishment. That is how Klali is going to have a better din, a better chos. 
The Rosh Hashiva of Paris Yasef, in the Sefer Arl Tzin, however, explains this a little bit differently. There are Averis, isolated Averis, although so nothing is totally isolated. Whatever we do has some type of chain reaction effect on us. But for the most part, there are certain Averis, a person does it, it's an Averis, it stands on its own. Then there are certain Averis that trigger an avalanche of Averis for himself and for others that follow it. By the same token, a person does a mitzvah. With every mitzvah, there's a concept of mitzvah gideris mitzvah. But by some mitzvahs, more or less, it has its own path. Other mitzvahs are a catalyst for mitzvahs that suddenly jump up in all different directions. For you, for many others, there is an aveira, and then there is something that you do which represents a bundle of aveira. There's a mitzvah, and then sometimes you do one mitzvah, and as a result of that, there are bundles of mitzvahs. So the Medish doesn't need to say just numbers. That if you did a lot of the Zayrus, do a lot of mitzvahs. The Medish is saying if you did the kind of the Zayrus that triggers many of Zayrus, then you have to look for the kinds of mitzvahs that trigger many mitzvahs. In the Sefer Tufcha Yabiu, the following example is brought down, the shame of Zilberstein Shlita, the son of the Belyashev of Zangazant. If Yaakov Kamenevsky, the great Yeshiva of Tarabid Afrochen, Levrach, Libad, Mechaim, Mechaim, told the following story. When he was a young man, World War I began to burn. Of course, World War I was going to be the war to end all wars, and therefore everyone was going all out, and the innocent people in the middle were the ones that were paying the price. If Yaakov and his wife were refugees, they literally ran for their lives from town to town looking for refuge. Winter did not have much respect for the war. It didn't stay away that year. In a ravaging blizzard, of Yaakov and his wife managed to arrive in a town that they knew had only two yidden, but one of them was a very big yidden. They were looking for shelter not just as a matter of comfort. They were looking for shelter as a matter of saving their lives. In the freezing cold, they found a house, and of Yaakov pounded at the door. A man opened the window, clearly he was one of the two yidden in town. And he yelled, What do you want? And Yabiakov said, Don't you see I'm a yid? But run away from the nearby town. It's blazing. Me and my wife were standing here. We're freezing. We're cold. It's pouring. The man said, Go away. Yabiakov couldn't believe it. Are you a yid? Are you an anical of the Ramavinu? We're freezing. We don't know if we're going to survive the night. The man said, go away. Finally, Yaakov pleaded with him that he at least allow them to remain outside under the canopy of his home. So while they won't be protected from the wind, at least they'll be protected from the rain. The man agreed to that, but only to that. Yaakov thought that that would be a stepping stone. At least he would come to the door with a hot coffee. It never happened. Baruch Hashem, they survived that night. They managed to make it to shelter the next day. And to Shul, to a Shul, the next Shabbos, not their Shul, their town was in flames. And this rich man was in the Shul on Shabbos also. And he was called up to an aliyah at a Sefer Torah. This was too much for Yaakov. He went over to the Rav, and he said, How can you give a Rosh and Marusha like that, an aliyah? The man is not the Gedda Yehudi. He should not be called to the Sefer Torah. I cannot believe he has a moon in the Rabbi Shalayim. How can he, during a time like this, leave people outside? Literally, leaving them to what Alpidar HaTava should have meant. Freezing to death. This man is not a Yid. He has no Yiddish blood in him. He is a din of a Russia. He has no Shaykhus to Yiddishkeit. Why are you confident him? Why are you giving him an Aliyah? The Rav said that the man is not so bad. He supports many causes. He has helped many Yidden. And he has even sheltered many Yidden in the past. But you should know that same day that you came, another couple was there. They knocked on the door, the Rav told him. The man took them in with open arms. And it turned out that they were a bunch of Ganavim. In the middle of the night, they emptied his china closet. They emptied his break front. Took money, took whatever they can get a hold of. And left. And then you came right afterwards. So he was scared to take you in. What do you want from him? It's hard to blame him. It turns out later, Rabbi Yaakov explained, that this man once even housed the whole yeshiva of Slobodka in his house. It's true. He was just scared to take them in afterwards. Now one day, those two people that came 
and they stole everything from the house. One day they may think, you know, we have to do tshuva on that geneva. But would they think in their minds that they also have to do tshuva on who knows how many people that went through the night freezing or maybe even lost their lives because this man could not get himself to open his door anymore out of sheer fright? Not because he was bad? This is an example of chaviles of Averis. All they did was they stole a couple of bachas, stole a couple of spoons, turned a couple of knobs on his safe and took some money. No, money can be replaced. But they didn't just steal money. They were literally taking lives. They had no idea and may never have known until it was too late, until they got to the other man and had to give it to the husband what the ramifications of their actions were. That is an example of chavilois of Averis. And now let me give you an example of Chavilo Shlomitzvah. I want to tell you a story about an old yid that I knew as we were growing up by the name of Rabbi Yisim. Rabbi Yisim and Drevitsin were here in America during the difficult years. The remaining Hashem Shabbos was an act of almost ultimate seriousness. There was nothing to fall back on. If you didn't work on Shabbos, you didn't have a job. And if you didn't have a job at the turn of the century, you went hungry. Rabbi Yisim opened up his little home to refugees as they started coming in after the war. My own parents, my father, my mother, found a home in Rabbi Yisuf's little apartment. They walked them down to their chuppah. They made the arrangements for their wedding. They were the father and mother to many, many assignments. But getting back to the Depression years, so Rabbi Yisuf was looking for a job. Everybody was looking for a job. Plumbers were looking for a job. Carpenters were looking for a job. Lawyers were looking for a job. Doctors were looking for a job. Nothing was moving. This was the Great Depression. There was nothing to eat at home, especially for people who wouldn't work on shops. So the ISIS would get online every morning in front of an unemployment agency. Long, long line. He would get to the window. And it was like a ritual every single day. Any job? Any employment? No, nothing. Come back tomorrow. Most of the people, when they got that answer, walked off to the park, and they would sit down over there and start playing chess, checkers, cards. This bothered Rabbi Yisuf. He went over to a table, a little concrete table and the concrete benches in the park, and he went over to a couple of yidden sitting there, and he said, why don't you come with me to the base of Medjish? That's where I go every single day. And one of them yelled, the base of Medjish? People are starving to death. People are jumping off roofs, and you're going to the base of Medjish? And Rabbi Yisuf answered, and what are you doing? People are starving and people are jumping off roofs and you're sitting here playing chess? At least if they don't have this world, they'll have the next world. And you? What are you going to have to show for yourself? So one man said, I would go with you to the basic manager. I don't know what to do there. I never learned a word in my life. And the answer knew that, ah, this is what he was looking for. Come with me, he said. He put his arms around his shoulders and said, come with me for an hour. He took him into the basic manager and he looked with him a couple of pages in Ein Yaakov. The next day, the next day. Then he got him with a shear of people learning Chayodam, invited him over for Shabbos. And being that they went through this ritual of standing on the unemployment line for six months, Rabbi Yisif, and this particular year, so until now just sat on the park bench smoking a cigar, playing cards, Rabbi Yisif and this card player now became Chavusas and Rabbi Yisif for six straight months. And the Yid had his first taste of the real Shabbos. He was not a very young person. He knew he was Jewish. He spoke Yiddish. He went to the Jewish theater. But Rabbi Yosef had opened up a whole new world for him. Rabbi Yosef also convinced him to send his children to Yeshiva. Something unheard of, almost unheard of in those days. Right now, as we talk, this man that Rabbi Yosef pulled into the base of Medrash, have over 100 grandchildren throughout Eretz Yisrael in different cities, different places, some Hasidish, some Litvish, some Yeshivish, that are sitting and learning, that are sitting and learning from morning until evening, that are sending their children to Yeshivas and to Chadarim. Rabbi Yosef, who walked over to the table of those people playing cards during those difficult times and put his arms around one gentleman and said, come in and learn a page of Enyaka with me. Rabbi Yosef did one mitzvah. How many Afikonmans were eaten as a result of that one mitzvah? How many generations of Erlach Yidin Shemrei Toyah and Mitzvahs exist now in the world because of that one mitzvah? 
So yes, there are certain Aveiros that are a catalyst for many, many more bundles of Aveiros. But by the same token, the Medrash says, as dangerous and as catastrophic as those Aveiros are, and how much they rob Klau Yisrael of its ability to ask for Kapara and Mechila, there is a way to offset it. And that is to concentrate on mitzvahs, where you do one mitzvah and it results in bundles and bundles of other mitzvahs. So is there any wonder now? Why the Pasuk says, Bezais, that with this, Yavai Aaron, El Akaidish Aaron, can come into the Kaidish Kedashin. Chazal tell us that a person goes through several judgments. There's a certain kind of judgment that a uh, Neshama goes through every single night when he goes to sleep. There's a Din V'Cheshbin that we go through every Rosh Hashanah that determines the outcome of the next year. There's a Din V'Cheshbin Liach and Meyav Yes Hashanah. And then it says also that there's a Din before Tchiyas HaMesa. The Liyas Lavai, the Neshama, once again will have to go through a total accounting of all the things that they did on this world and face judgment. How many times can a person be judged? If he was already judged by his ultimate din, the cheshbin, liachamei, the yashim shona, what's the point of rejudging him later? He was already judged. After that judgment, liachamei, the yashim shona, he did not have the opportunity to do any more mitzvahs. And he didn't have to worry about doing any more of anyways. He just had his car in Eilam Hamba. He had his time and he had his pleasure. So, what's the point in judgment? Where's the mocking here for another judgment? So one sort of art, it could be the Shimmer of Aaron, I'm not sure. When a person finishes the year, they judge his actions that year. They judge the actions of his life, not just his actions, but the ramifications of his actions. But they can only judge the ramifications of his actions in terms of what took place until that time of judgment. But what a person does on this world, both in the positive sense and negative sense, the ripple effect can continue for many, many generations afterwards. But Yosef, who put his arm around that yin and took him into the base measures, every split second there's another Amin Yehoshim Rabba. There's another mitzvah. There's another Tzil and Leighton. And that's where there's another judgment before Tchiyas Mason. Because we have to take into account not what the person did. What he did, he can only do during his lifetime. But we have to take in account what happened as a result of his actions and the results continue to play themselves out continue to be displayed generation after generation there's no end to it it can be a thousand years later it can be two thousand years later and that's why there's a need for another judgment thus the Medjish says look for not just mitzvahs but bundles of mitzvahs mitzvahs that last forever and the Pasuk says you shall keep my laws. And the Torah gives us three mitzvahs, all within the context of Shatnas or Klein. First, the Torah Gdasha tells us, You shall not breed your animal in a mixture of species. The second is, You shouldn't plant your field in a mixture of different types of seeds. And the third is, Neither shall a garment of a mixture of, and we know that means wool and linen, come upon you. The Rebbein of Bechaya gives us a beautiful sort of overview on understanding the Yisui Klayim, all three of them. And the Rebbein of Bechaya approaches this from three different perspectives. Number one, he says, Alder Hapshat. The Rebbein Hashem created this world, and the Rebbein Hashem created the world with a certain amount of species, whether it's plants, whether it's animal life. There are more than we can count. However, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created an exact amount, exactly what the world needs, exactly what the cycle of nature needs in order to sustain itself. And every species down here, he explains, has a kayach and a mazel and mile that corresponds to something in the heavenly realm that nourishes it. When you put two animals together to create a third species, and the same with plants, so it's as if you're saying to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, your world is not perfect. I want to add to it. Now how would that explain the Yisra to plow with a shor and a chamar together, with a donkey and an ox together? You're not producing a third mean then. 
But the Rebbe Chai says, well, the mimic of the of the Adama, the mimic of the farmers were that after they would plow with two different types of animals together, there would be mark of them. Indeed, they would mate them together to produce another mean. And all of it is considered a hakhosh in my sabreshes. Now, it's important to understand that the Rebbe Shon gave us within the context of my sabreshes an ability to be creative, an ability to discover many of nature's hidden opportunities and kaychais. But what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want us to do, although He gave us obviously the prayer to do it, but what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want us to do is to create a third mean. That's a way of suggesting that you have different ideas of how you would have created the world. This is Albera Chabshat to explain the three Isurei Klein. To wrap it up in one sentence, the Rebbe Nebuchadnezzar says, the Torah is telling us, don't try to be smarter than a Kodesh Baruch. A second perspective on this, he says, is Alderach HaMesh. And while we're saying, don't try to be smarter than a Kodesh Baruch, we're saying over here, don't try to be smarter than yourself. Yes, we are Ms. Bonain and the Tanei HaMitzvahs, but again, there are certain mitzvahs that are called Chukim, a chak does not mean that it has no tam. A chak means we don't understand the tam. And the Torah prefaces the mitzvah of Klein with as chukai say However, there's a lot that you can understand just in the context of not understanding in terms of how it applies to us. For example, the Rebbein of the Chayyim says, Hashem chafet saman sigda yagdol Torah the Yagdol. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Torah to Klein Yisrael. And the mitzvahs of Torah are an opportunity that by fulfilling those mitzvahs we are zaychet to chayi u'olam haba. The mitzvahs are investment opportunities that are ma'achet us to bring a kedusha and our neshama that bind us to a kaddish baruch Hu, and we can reap the benefits forever after. And a kaddish baruch Hu, in his great kindness gave us an opportunity to perform mitzvahs under any set of circumstances. The Torah wanted that if a farmer goes to plow his field, he should not forget about a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Rather, he should hook the two oxen together, thinking, ah, oh, and now I am the kind of mitzvah like Sachosh B'Shaw B'Chamar Yachtov, because I would never use an ox and a donkey. A person comes to plant his field, the Kaddish Baruch Hu gave us an opportunity to perform a mitzvah while he's doing it. Let me be careful, the farmer says, to fulfill the mitzvah and not to be over the love of Sat Chalei Sizra Kray. He comes to cut his field. He's careful to be mekayim the mitzvah of the leket kitzir cholay salaket. And then a person wants to do a simple act of putting on clothes. He also stops and thinks and says, "Let me fulfill the mitzvah of silver shatnes ubeged klein shatnes layala alecha." So, in other words, suppose you had an investment broker, and you knew he was the most trustworthy person in the world. No one ever accused him of being a gun, and he said to you. Do this and do that, and you will earn a million dollars. You're not going to stop and ask why, maybe, for us, how does it work? Someone who really has a sparkling reputation. Otherwise, you have to ask. But this person, no one ever doubted him. And you could hardly get to him. But now he came to you and he said, This is it, and you have only this minute to do it. So who's interested in asking questions? You run with your checkbook. How it works, you'll find out later. That's really what the debate of Achai is saying in the second chapter. Why the Ari Suri Kriyim? We ask the Lava in the Oil of the Emes, Lachamayli Asim Shana. We will know. We will understand. Right now, Chaperayim. There's no time for speculation and philosophy. Right now, just think of it. Hakadosh Baruch Hu gave us opportunities to invest in our future that lasts forever. And then the Rebbe Bechayi explains this from a third perspective. The Aldera HaKabbalah, the Soid Mitzvah Sakwayim, he says. These are Mitzvahs that are called Chokim. And when it comes to a Chok, he says, that also means, besides for the simple concept of Chok, that we don't know what the reason is, or it doesn't have an obvious reason, but Chok also means that it's tied to higher in Yon. Like it says, Chukah is Shemayim, tied to the heavenly realm. Chukah of the Mishpat of Yisrael, Kichak Yisrael. All these are in Yonim, that there are certain connections to the way the Bria works which relate to Kral Yisrael. The Rabbeinu Bechai explains 
as he did in his Hagdam over here, that everything in this world has a Malach in a heavenly realm. As Chazal tells us, Ein Lecha Kol Eisev, there is no blade of grass down here in this world that doesn't have a Malach that tells it to grow and grow. And that in turn is connected to a higher realm, and perhaps we can Hesaf as Deer explain over here what the Nefesh Chaim said. What the Nefesh Chaim said, just like in the physical world, there is a growth, and there's an Hashem. Now the growth is what we see, the growth is what is tangible in a practical sense, but everyone realizes that the Nisham is the whole life of the growth. Without the Nisham, the growth becomes meaningless. In a higher realm, the Nisham that we have becomes growth. And there's a Nisham to that Nisham. And if you go a step higher, where it's more Ruchmiyas and even less physical, so the Nisham of the lower world becomes the growth, and there is a high in the Shama. And so on and so on. And ultimately he explains how Kaddish Baruch Hu himself is in the Shama for everything. Kaddish Baruch Hu is the Kaddish of existence for everything on this world. Now the Rebbein Abachai explains that in the Yishtal Shul of Tchoy Lamas, each Neshama is only happy when it is Mashpia life to the good in the world that is a Madrega lower than it. All the Malach and Nishamayim, everything has a Kayach, it's Mumuna on something. It has to provide life for something. That's how we find the story of Pichas Bayaro, for example. Came to the river and he said to the river, split, I have to go through. And the river didn't want, and they had a whole debate. And the Pichas Bayaro argued that I'm going to be Makayim, the myths of Pidyan Shvuyim, of redeeming prisoners. So you must split for me. And the river answered back, but I also have a myth with the flow over here. And I had a whole debate, a whole argument. And at the end, they stopped arguing, and the Pichas Bayari said, the way a parent would talk to a child after you try explaining things nicely and it's not working, whether you like it or not, this is the way it is. Either you open up for me, if not, gives Rani a lecha that no water will ever flow here again. We know the story, not only did it split for a Pichas Bayari, it also split for a year that was following him afterwards, was carrying flour from that place, and also for an Arab merchant who are traveling with them. So people shouldn't say that you didn't leave those that are traveling with them alone. We have several examples of these kinds of things. What does it mean that Pichas Mayar was arguing with the river? How can you argue with the river? The answer is that everything in this world has a kayak of fear in an olam that is above this olam, and a tzaddik like Pichas Mayar can relate directly with that. He went right to the source. He went to the boss of the river. So there's a Kayach Lamaila, which in a way you can say is sort of the Neshama of the river, that is Mashpia, the Kayach of this river for it to flow. There's a Lashon in Chazal, says the Rebbeinah B'chaya, Afila hu al yoinim tzrichim shalim. Aysa shalim in Raimah. And what is the shalim in the Raimah? Do these Malachim really argue? And the answer is the Shlemus of a Neshama in Shemayim, where these Kayachs who al yoinim is that they can be Mashpia, they can fully give over life to whoever they're in charge of or the growth that is related to them in the chain of worlds until it manifests itself in this Gashmiistic world down here at the bottom of the ladder. This was Dr. Rebbein of I quote him. Haman is told us lemata min b'minoi. When a person produces in this world min b'minoi, planting correctly, plowing correctly, when you are producing and guaranteeing a kiyum of the world within the context of how HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to do it, not mixing species. So you are going a shlemus l'mayla. You are going a tremendous simcha in the heavenly realm. Because each of these malachim, each of these koichas or yainim that are in charge to send over their hashbar sachayim to the next step are happy. However, when someone is minded tovois lamata, when you create something down here in this world, which is mean b'she'enoyinai, which Hakadosh Baruch Hu did not intend for us to do, although He gave us a prayer to be able to do it, halavagoyim hepach hashalom. Then you call it the opposite of shalom. You are the arvei the kaichet loyoyinai. Because what happens is, if you take two different kinds of seeds and you produce a third fruit, so. The Malach and the Shemayim that are Mimuna on these respective fruits suddenly are forced to cross their wires, so to speak. They have to be Mashpia to give it a Chiyas. But 
but each one doesn't have an ability to be mashpia in full because you have created something new. You've created something which is a crossbreed between two things. So if I force you to take something that belongs to you and give it away to someone else that you have no shaykhus with, this creates the lack of shalom and shemai. And the Rebbein of Achai explains that the Emes, the term Klayim is a Russian of Mania, a Russian of holding back, of refraining. You're being Mavatol the Kalchas or Yainim. Leisich Lerachmecha Mimen, the Pasik said. Don't do things that sort of curtails HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Rachman if under normal circumstances it would be Mashpia for us. How do you refer to a prison? A base Hakela. Why? Because a person who is placed in prison no longer has the kayak to be mashpia in the way that his normal life functions. He can't provide for his family. And that's what happens when you produce Christ. You are curtailing the ability of these heavenly spheres to be mashpia in the normal process of Bria Sa'ilam, how the world gets its life. And that's what the Torah refers to it as Chuk and says the Dana Bechai. Chuk is also from the Lashon of Chakika or Tzir, a stamp or a picture. There is a certain arrangement, there is a certain setup of a Yon and Sichlium of Ruchmius with the patterns of Shemayim. And you are distorting the picture by creating crime. You're being the Arve of the Kaifus Yainim. You're confusing the normal routes. You're crossing wires. You're mixing up the highway. Sometimes, certain of the Kaifus that come down to this world are Kaifus of Kedosha and the other are Ruchus of Tum. And by creating something which is a crossbreed of both, you are injecting into this world a confusion between Kiddusha and Tahar, as Rabbeinu B'chayim continues. By keeping them separate, you are maintaining the distinction between holiness and the lack of Sash. The Rabbeinu B'chayim also explains in regard to Tzamer and Pishtin, in regard to wool and linen, if you go back to the beginning of my separation, right afterward, Hevel and Kain both brought Karbonis. Hevel brought sheep, which is wool, and Kayin brought flax, which is Pishtim. And although we can only repeat the words, it's hard to understand what this really means, but because the two of them brought these carbonates together, and therefore right from the start there was a mixture, there was an irvul of the carcass of Taizer, and the results were disastrous. When a person mixes Semeru Pishtim, and it's only also that it's Shura Tavizanuz, it has to be interwined, he's my Arabic, those same carcass of Taizer and carcass of Ra. In a Shemayim, whatever is Mashpia Kiddusha, whatever is Mashpia Tuma, gets crossed. And therefore it says, Begit Klein Shatnas Lo Yala Alech. In other words, don't bring this Ruach HaTuma on you, because that's what happens when you wear Shatnas. In the Sefer Nefz HaTzalash or Yeshiva Smir, it says that there was one Yom Kippur where one Bacher walked out of the Beis Medrash, and he came back wearing his weekday clothes. And when they asked him about this later, he said, I just felt that the davening wasn't going. I usually daven with much as I is on Yom Kippur. And here, I, I managed to have no chayshik. I looked into Sifri Musa, nothing helped. And then it occurred to me that perhaps Shatnis, it says, is one of the things that is monea, a person's tefillah from going up to Shemayim. There is a kaya chatumah that blocks it. And I realized I just bought a new suit right before Yom Kippur, and perhaps it was not properly checked. So I went to change my clothes. And you know something? As soon as I changed my clothes, I felt like my neshama started to shine within me. So afterwards, they went to a tailor, a shemit tailor mitzvah, and he tried to find the client, but he couldn't find it. It seems okay, he said. But eventually, he went to someone who was a mumch, an expert in finding client, and he showed him where the shop was on the back. So the tailor says, La yalo lecha, don't take upon yourself this kind of virus, this kind of black, that's going to prevent the normal hashpoys of kiddusha from manifesting itself. Now, it's interesting. There are exceptions to when we wear crying. One is, fifth is when you have tchelas. And also, by the big dekehanim, dafke b'shat to avoid it. So, the Veda v'chayat is a reason for that. That is the Beis HaMikdash, the ultimate hashlama to the Bria, and also the kayach of tchelas, which represents Yerushanayim in its greatest way, Yerushanayim, Baruch Hu's full hashras hashchim of this world. That's why we don't have tchelas today. It's only the Yosid Lafat. And during such a period, the light shines so brightly that as much as you're going to try to mix up the karikas and tell the rod, they're going to remain distinct anyway. And he says that's the rumors in the Yeshav Chayo, Darshat Semet, Lufishtim, the Tas, the Chayfet, Kapel. 
Dasha Tamer of Fishtim, the Yeshu Chayel, is clearly aware of the dangers of mixing the Kaisers of Toivara. And she understands that Tas Bechaifat Kapel refers to the Mitzvah of Tzitzis, where only in the proper environment can they be clearly distinguished so that one doesn't confuse the other. There's a story that is brought down that the Rishban was always very careful, never looked past his Dalar And he once sat down on the wagon, and the Rabbeinu Tam passed by, and he said to him, Alti Tzadik Harba. See, Mare Menecha, sometimes you have to look up, and you will see that Sus prepared Likrasecha, that there was a horse and a mule that were tied together, and they were about to pull the wagon. In other words, this world is indeed a confusing world, where Kedusha and Tumah are often intertwined. And it's hard to know the difference and follow the correct path. So, to tell you, Akdash, here is your set of mitzvahs. Follow them, and you will automatically, whether you understand it or not, be sifting out the Kalchas Hatuma, and you'll be following the road of Kiddush. This year is distributed by Kolodach, 11 Stay Street, Yerushalayim. For donations, please call 02-5383-999. Fax, 02-538-02. Six seven post box five seven zero three five.